Hello, thank you everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This invitation by Zivansa and by Dr. Alabaja, my old friend from the times of the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. My topic today is the whole of the endologist and the endology lab to improve IY and IVF, success rates for main fertility. I have no financials or scientific uh, conflicts of interest with this lecture. Uh, these are my uh, uh, titles, which you have already been uh, uh, set by kindly by the organizing committee. Uh, this is a view of uh, uh, Andrology Laboratory. So a, a full-scale, high-complex Andrology Laboratory is a must-have in a, a sister reproduction and inf in infertility scenario. So, uh, Doctor, you, I you need... you, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I request you to kindly screen share again. We can't see your screen. Excuse me? Excuse can me? You, can you do the share screen again? We can't see your screen. Oh, okay. Okay, now it's better? Perfectly fine, Doctor. Please carry on. Okay. Thank you. So I, I, I think I, I will start from the beginning, okay? Just show this first slides. So the topic is the whole of the endologist and the endology lab for improving IY and IVF success for main fertility component. I have no scientific or uh, conflicts of interest with this lecture. Um, this is a full view of the Andrology Laboratory. So it's a must have an Andrology, a full scale Andrology Laboratory in an assisted reproductive scenario to improve sex rest rates, both for natural pregnancy, also for assisted reproductive technologies. Uh, Androscience is located in Brazil, but we have worldwide collaborations and, uh, and interactions with all, all continents. Hopefully, uh, our, 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 our uh, uh, friendship with Dr. Alabaja will, in the future, foster our collaboration. These are the, the, the research protocols we have ongoing with several different uh, persons in the world. And Androsize is committed to the United Nations 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which says that uh, universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services and reproductive health must be included in the awareness of the public health. So therefore, this lecture is part of this uh, main objective. Modern andrology has several interactions with, with male fertility, male hypogonadism, uh, with a high complex clinical and research andrology laboratory, cryo reservation facility, oncology center, adolescence health, uh, develop, dev, development endocrinology, uh, of, of course, with the female fertility expert, experts, gynecology, the reproductive endocrinology, nutritionist, uh, psychology, etc. Microsurgery must be a part uh, of, the, of the scenario for andrology. We need to improve microsurgical skills in men before they go to assisted reproductive technologies, both for varicose repair and also um, um, surgical techniques. So the modern andrology laboratory interacts with in, in all this uh, huge environment that surrounds infertile couple. And what's the rationale behind our work is that defective sperm function is a major cause of male fertility and likely a reflex of male, male hypogonadism, low testosterone, etc. So poor sperm motility, poor sperm morphology, the is the impaired sperm egg interaction, all these are, are raise the hands, are flagships for something that's going wrong in the couple's reproductive system. Uh, what is surprising that the fertility, the number of total sperm count has decreased by 59% in the last 40 years in all continents. So uh, more research is urgently necessary. And many of the nations most developing the world are not uh, sufficient uh, uh, growth to replace their own population. So what we see is that an increasing amount of infertility and miscarriage all over the globe. So what's, what's changing? What's happening so fast? Uh, of course, the environmental chemicals, nutrition, social environment, uh, all these uh, in interactions with epigenetics, uh, also, the uh, incredible uh, increase in the use of drugs and uh, anabolic steroids, alcohol consumption, now more recently the vaping 
e-cigars. So uh, all these uh, new uh, substances or old substances that are every time being more decriminalized in the Western society, mainly are decreasing men's fertility. So I don't believe there is a right way to do drugs. And I don't believe that uh, you can uh, safely introduce, uh, for instance, marijuana uh, into societies. I'm not talking about the uh, cannabidiol or cannabinol for medical purpose, of course. Also, uh, the Western society and all many countries in the world are becoming increasingly, uh, obesity is a problem and exercises are becoming more and more common. In many countries like the city I live, Sao Paulo has a lot of pollution. So I'm, I'm telling you this introduction to understand that this, this sperm, spermatozoa is only a reflex of all these conditions. So you cannot just pick up any sperm and go ahead and do anything you want because you have a spermatozoa. A spermatozoa is nothing more than a mirror of what happens in the body of, the, of a male and its surrounding, its environment, okay? Also, there's a widespread of use of external substances to enhance muscular activity or to foster uh, the, the strength. So these are all uh, contaminated with uh, testosterone or byproducts. With, uh, uh, we have recently looked at 105 toxic substances into, into these uh, products that are supposed to enhance health. And the SARS-CoV-2, this coronavirus pandemic, we have just published many papers. Uh, I believe it will be a huge impact into men's health, particularly in sperm motility. So in the future, we'll be seeing more and more uh, uh, infertile men. As we have demonstrated, all cells in the testes are uh, uh, infected by this virus. Not just Sertoli cells, which produce spermatozoa, but also Leydig cells, that produce uh, testosterone, uh, the vascular endothelium. There is a great, huge amount of uh, uh, invasion from this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in the, the testes. And that we, we don't know yet the how, for how long or for how much time this will be affecting men's health, but for sure it's here to stay. This is an old May evaluation sequence where you start by history and physical examination that this is unchanged. I believe that with all technological advances, nothing replaces the good medical practice. So we still need a very uh, sophisticated, very comprehensive history and physical examination of the male conducted by a senior uh, urologist and andrologist with training in male fertility. The semi-analysis times two, uh, this is old, but uh, semi-analysis, what I want to show you clearly is not enough to uh, say all these uh, previous situations that I have demonstrated to you. So it's not just uh, like the old days, like before, when you we didn't have all these players in scenario. Uh, if it's abnormal, it'll make gonotoxins, not improve hormone evaluations, etc. So this is very simple, and today is, in, is, is, is not enough. Uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has just released uh, 2021 the sixth edition of the manual for examination and processing of women's sperm, human semen. And you can see the 55% percentile, meaning that 5% uh, of these men achieved pregnancy in 12 months without protection. The concentration is 16 million sperm per ml. But if you go for 50% percentile, it goes up to 66 million per ml. And the total sperm per ejaculate 210 instead of 39 million. Uh, you see progressive motility goes between 30 and 55 percent and uh, uh, normal forms from 3 to uh, 14 percent. So actually uh, a sperm analysis, simple sperm analysis is insufficient to dictate the functional ability of a spermatozoa. And the key element in our discussion is that not just any sperm is necessary for uh, fertilization and early embryonic development. We clearly need a good quality sperm. And that is the main objective of andrology and uh, uh, andrology laboratories to provide good quality sperm if assisted reproduction is mandatory. So the treatment of corrective causes goes for a diagnostic evaluation. We need a full scale diagnosis before going ahead. So semi-analysis does not provide a male diagnosis. We need to know what's behind 
that the sperm abnormality. Uh, you have to treat the patient. You have to make sure that correctal problems are treated. And if any maternal reproductive potential is beyond one year, you must correct uh, the male factor to improve the ability for natural pregnancy and even for assisted reproductive techniques. So before going for intrauterine insemination, in vitro fertilization, with or without intracytoplasmic sperm injection, we need to treat the male patient. The IY is a huge number of uh, intrauterine inseminations, a huge number of variables that uh, make this uh, possible scenario. And we want to improve the chance of pregnancy. And to, I believe that IY must be fostered. I believe IY has a huge potential in the future, not just in the past, if we provide good quality sperm. Therefore, we need to speak about the impact of oxygen stress and DNA fragmentation. You see a normal spermatozoa is a very sophisticated cell. You see here immature sperm, and you see here a pathological reactive oxygen species decreasing sperm quality. It's like a thunder cloud or volts of electricity. So uh, reactive oxygen species is like this thunder in the sperm surface which makes uh, the sperm surface, the sperm membrane cell vulnerable to attack. We can actually measure reactive oxygen species in the lab using many uh, techniques. We adopted the chemiluminescence, which gives a very precise measurement of reactive oxygen species in the spermatozoa, both uh, intracellular and extracellular. And we have developed uh, uh, reference values for ROS if we, with and without leukocytes in the fertile population. And uh, what's the goal of this uh, reactive oxygen species? Because it, it makes the holes in the membrane and uh, actually it lastly causes DNA fragmentation of the spermatozoa. You can also measure DNA fragmentation by flow cytometry use sperm chromatin structure assay, which I believe is the gold standard for the world, is the most accurate method uh, uh, whatsoever. And we have the evaluation of normal sperm as well as sperm with high DNA fragmentation index. Uh, age is a problem, not just for the women, but for the men. We have demonstrated that men beyond 40 years old have increased oxygen species. And uh, you see that the DNA uh, damage also increases with the increased male age. Uh, sperm DNA damage, therefore, is a reduced fertility, increased miscarriage, and the novel mutations in the offspring. Uh, Two-thirds of men visiting IVF clinics have moderate to severe oxidative DNA damage. So our goal as an andrologist is to reduce these sperm function abnormalities before you go for IY or IVF or uh, ICSI because this is not uh, free from uh, problems in the offspring. Uh, a brand DNA repair, you can increase in the embryo miscarriage, genetic diseases, neurological conditions, metabolic diseases, and also cancer. So uh, it's not just a question of, uh, it's a health problem to improve sperm quality before IVF. You know? uh, smoking is a problem in many countries and smoking is not directly related to sperm DNA damage in the, uh, in the man that smokes it, the problem is in the offspring. You have an increased chance of cancer in the offspring of male smoking. Good news is that many antioxidants can play a role, a role in quality, uh, rescue sperm quality by diminishing oxidated DNA uh, that is in the, in the spermatozoa. And also have demonstrated that uh, vitamin D is associated with seeming parameters and serum testosterone levels. So each unit of vitamin D uh, it's a 2.1% increase in progressive motile spermatozoa and ejaculate. This is the mechanism behind the action of vitamin D in the spermatozoa, and then it's actually something that we should uh, focus in the future. Uh, also, we have demonstrated that in the laboratory, you can improve sperm quality by adding substances like caffeine supplementation, uh, which increases the quality of the, the mitochondrial activity. Mitochondria is the energy source for the somatozoa. It's like a, a energy power for your home. So mitochondria is like you have the light to watch TV and listen to this lecture right now. So mitochondria provides energy for the cell. 
we can improve it in the lab. But first, before improving the lab, you want to improve in vivo, in the person, okay? Also in the lab, we have uh, demonstrated that we're adding substance, we can improve the ability of the spermatozoa to provide more motility or resistance to cryopreservation. So we have, the Andrology Lab has the resources, technical resources to improve sperm quality in vitro. And andrology, clinical andrology, aerologist has the ability to improve sperm quality in vivo, in the patient, in the male. I'm going to talk uh, about a little bit about varicose, which I think is a very prominent uh, scenario for any, anybody to discuss and gives us a good insight on what to expect from andrology. As you know, the test is, uh, has to work uh, under 33 to 35 degrees Celsius and the body temperature is 36.7 degrees Celsius. It's like a, a cooling system that we have in the body to decrease uh, the scrotum temperature to provide the op optimal scenario for somatozoa and for hormone activity. A varicocele is nothing more than the dilation of the veins in the pepiniform plexus in the testes that will decrease sperm quality by giving sperm immaturity. So the sperm does not go all the way to the end of spermiogenesis. So you release immature sperm in the ejaculate and that's not good for fertilization. The optimal approach is a subinguinal microsurgical correction of the varicocele. You need some uh, microsurgical skills to do that. It's not uh, very sophisticated, but it is, is, uh, is the best scenario for varicocele. And the varicocele repair has been proven to be very positive to improve men's fertility in many, many publications. You see, uh, for if a fixed model, you have a, a, a P value, odds ratio of 4.5, 15%, four times more pregnancy if you do a varicocele repair than if you don't do a varicocele repair and in a men's uh, uh, health and fertility. Also, varicocele is associated with a decreasing reactive oxygen species and uh, a decreasing the, the amount of DNA fragmentation in many, many studies. I can see here uh, reduction is in oxidative stress and DNA fragmentation. There are tons of studies that uh, uh, back up the varicocele co correction before you go for IY or IVF. And the most significant study is, uh, as you can see here, if you have a previous indication for ICSI, by doing a varicocele repair, you can 31% go for IY or even spontaneous pregnancy. If you have an indication for classic in vitro fertilization, 50% uh, of patients go, can go for IY or spontaneous pregnancies. And if you are a candidate for insulatory insemination, if you proceed a varicocele or any way, you, you, you can go for natural pregnancy in 40% of the patients. So, so this is very significant of the andrology and the andrology laboratory in helping. Also, varic this is a study conducted at the time uh, when I met Dr. Alabadi at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, we can see that uh, varicocele uh, improves the success rates of intra insemination uh, by a C pregnancy cycle, 6.3 to 12% uh, uh, pregnancy cycle. But look at the live birth per couple, it goes from 4.2% in untreated to 32% in treated patients. So live birth per couple increases dramatically if you correct the varicocele. The message is that men should be screened for varicocele before intraoperative termination is initiated for male factor infertility. Not just for the varicocele, but all the factors that I have pointed before you. And also uh, in advanced maternal age, microsurgical varicocele is also indicated. That's a, that's a huge issue because uh, uh, usually IVF clinic is hurry up in going ahead for IVF or ICSI if the mother is uh, advanced maternal age, but a uh, varicocele provides in, in three or four months uh, extra sperm quality so that the reproductive endocrinology or gynecology can go ahead with the same technique, but with more chances for success. See, this is all over. There are many, many publications. I'm not going to stick to each one of them just to, to, to provide extra information for you. You can see that the chance for, for, for life birth per couple uh, 
uh, using IVF or ICSI goes uh, almost two times, life worth per couple in IY goes up to 8.3 times. And even for the most severe cases, is 250% higher improvement in chance of life birth rates and the pregnancy if you go for vertical seal repair. This is just an example of a patient that we have published. Uh, the spermatozoa before he had done six uh, cycles of IVF after he repair, repaired the varicose seal and gave antioxidants. This is the sperm. You can see clear. You don't need to be an analogist to understand that this sperm cell is much better than this sperm cell. And uh, he used ICSI because of severe uh, infertility, but we now with the one attempt and pregnancy. Another case this looks like uh, this is spermatozoa before we treated the patient. This is the new spermatozoa. Again, uh, many cycles of IVF ICSI uh, with failure, uh, the first cycle with success. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, doctor. Very good evening, Dr. Gautam. Thank you. George. Good evening, doctor. Thank you very much. Let us begin. This is a patient webinar and we should go straight to the topic. At the end of my lecture, we'll take all the patient questions together. And uh, my topic today is uh, on the use of transvaginal ultrasound in medically assisted reproduction. Just like the stethoscope is to a physician, a transvaginal ultrasound unit is to a fertility physician. And patients must know that how useful it is right from diagnosis to therapeutics. So in diagnostics, as well as therapeutics. It's actually a wonderful story of how transvaginal ultrasound began helping us in assisted reproduction, in medically assisted reproduction, and now has become an integral part. We cannot do medically assisted reproduction without transvaginal ultrasound. So let's go with some basic things. I'll try to simplify this topic. The same topic I have given for IVF physicians in training the lecture. But let's try to simplify it for the layperson, for the patients. So what is human ovulation? We talk about ovulation and can it be seen by transvaginal ultrasound? So ovulation is the release of a mature pre-ovulatory follicle in expulsion of the oocyte or egg. So in the middle of the cycle, middle of the menstrual cycle in the fertile period, one month from the left ovary, one month from the right ovary, the fertile woman, a normal woman, releases an egg. And histological and laparoscopic observations have been used to demonstrate that the follicle develops a stigma. What is the stigma? The stigma is what you are seeing on the surface of the ovary. This red color bleb is a stigma from where this red color bleb emanates. It's a protrusion from the surface of the ovary shortly before follicular rupture. When we say follicular rupture, if you put in a laparoscope just before follicular rupture, you will see an image like this. The same image can be easily be seen by your regular grayscale transvaginal ultrasound. And there are two types of stigmas that you can appreciate on ultrasound. The flat type stigma where I have put this orange line here. This is the surface of the ovary. So the flat type stigma is an avascular area where the follicle wall comes into contact with the surface of the ovary. And the bleb type stigma, this orange line is the hypothetical line which defines the outer perimeter of the ovarian surface. And much of the follicular fluid may actually be hanging outside the ovary. And this is called a bleb type stigma. And this is barely contained by the thinning follicular wall. This is very important once your IVF physician or the sonologist knows how these stigmas look like and what is the picture just before impending ovulation, you can time your treatments better and give better success rates with low technology. This is not rocket science. This is just what the mind does not know, the eyes cannot see. So if you know, that these stigmas can be seen on ultrasound, you will be much more aware 
and how they present. So the, uh, this is not new. This was published in 1992 and 94 in the White Journal. And most of the publications in the earlier times were from Canada. The follicle, instead of losing its tense round, up, it, instead of being like a balloon, when you keep on pull, putting air into the balloon, you expect that just before ovulation, the follicle is going to become turgid and then rupture. On the contrary, the follicle loses its tense round appearance just before ovulation is imminent. Rather than becoming increasingly turgid immediately before ovulation, the follicles appear to become flaccid. So the person monitoring your cycle must know these physiological signs. So this is on a regular, you know, a portable machine where you can see this is a blep type stigma, a blep type stigma, a flat type stigma and a blep type stigma here. This is again, you can see actually a blep type stigma ah. protruding from outside the surface of the ovary. George, you'll have to mute your mic. Okay. Uh, and this is a very nice time-lapse photography uh, uh, chart, which shows that this, this was a group of volunteers in the University of Saskatchewan in Canada, where a transvaginal sonography probe was put in from periods ranging from two hours to 13 hours at the time around the ovulation when they expected ovulation. And the entire ovulation was recorded on a VHS tape and then a time-lapse video was made and time-lapse photos were made. So this is a 13 hours time-lapse and you can see a flat type stigma collapsing. This is again routine transvaginal ultrasound, grayscale ultrasound. So this entire sequence of collapse took, this entire sequence of collapse took a few hours and the actual, when the, it took two hours for the last three slides, the last three pictures on the last line, it took two hours for the complete collapse of the follicle. In contradiction, a blep type stigma, the ovulation occurs rare, very fast. It's 11 minutes time lapse. And in a few minutes, generally, the collapse of the follicle happens because most of the fluid is already, in some cases, 70, 80% of the fluid is already hanging outside the surface of the ovary. What we must understand is that there is no 18 millimeter, 18 millimeter is not the holy grail of ovulation induction. That means all triggers and everything cannot be given at 18 millimeter transvaginal follicular size. Again, there have been experiments which have told us the ultrasound diameter and oocyte maturity happens at different ultrasound diameters. So at 18, 19 millimeter transvaginal ultrasound in natural cycles, you find most of the mature oocytes. In HMG cycles, you get mature oocytes at 18 millimeters. In recombinant FSH cycles at 15, 16 millimeters and in clomiphene cycles, 22 to 24 millimeters. Vaginal ultrasound is very, very useful in studying the endometrial morphology. So like, you know, the early proliferative phase, the mid-cycle triple layer and the secretory phase can be seen very clearly. So as you monitor the ovary simultaneously, you have to monitor the ovary using transvaginal ultrasound. These are some very nice pictures that define what is triple layer endometrium. And this is secretory endometrium, secretory endometrium. These upper three are triple layer endometrium around mid-cycle. Poor pregnancy rates using clomiphene citrate, citrate for induction of ovulations. These include, the reasons include a decrease in the quality of eggs when CC was used because of the negative impact on the cervical mucus and the negative impact on the quality of the endometrial lining. So if you see, there is a triple layer here, but it's indistinct, it's blurred. And when... This is another patient again with a pre-ovulatory blep type stigma, but the triple layer is not very distinct and the morphology is not very clear. But the moment you flip from clomiphene to an HMG cycle, you start seeing a very nice triple layer and you see 
very nice cervical mucus lower down that can also be picked up by vaginal ultrasound. And this is another teaching slide that we use that on transvaginal ultrasound, this hypoechoic area is not fluid in the endometrial cavity as physicians commonly make a mistake, but this is glycogen laden endometrial cells that at mid cycle, especially in HMG cycles, in gonadotropin cycles, you occasionally see pictures of these glycogen laden cells like this. And if it was fluid in the endometrial cavity, you would not see this central stripe you would see fluid in the upper and lower margins. On transvaginal ultrasound, you can also measure and quantify the cervical mucus. And there are studies which have put out a cervical scoring with the cervical mucus. Again, a hematocolpus, if you have an intact hymen, you have a hematocolpus of blood in the vagina that can be picked up very nicely with transvaginal ultrasound. Unfortunately, color Doppler never found its place in ultrasound. We still use grayscale basic transvaginal ultrasound. Evidence-based medicine never gave a green signal to uh, color Doppler in assisted reproduction. There have been a lot of publications in the late 90s and early 2000s that expounded on the predictive value of color Doppler on the follicular circumference vascularity. So this is grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, but not really, nothing really came out of it. The subsequent papers could not replicate the results. Again, adenomyosis or also called endometriosis interna as you have endometriotic posterior walls, anterior walls. You also have these endometriotic adenomyotic lakes in the subendometrial region. So these are very easily picked up by ultrasound. These have to be distinguished from the arcuate vessels in the myometrium. These really don't affect the uh, pregnancy rates. They are seen in women with pelvic congestion. Calcified arcuate vasculature can also be picked up by simple grayscale ultrasound. And fibroids, you can pick up submucous fibroids, intramural fibroids, subserous fibroids. If you do a hydroestrosonography, you can actually, just by putting in normal cell line, completely delineate the size and the type of fibroid in the cavity. Intrauterine polyps with, you know, can be picked up very easily with transvaginal ultrasound. This is a polyp, again another polyp. Multiple endometrial polyps can be picked up by transvaginal ultrasound. This is a short clip using just an infant feeding tube in a uterus. You inject the fluid in the uterine cavity and you can actually assess the uterine cavity in your own consulting room. You don't have to send the patient for more invasive tests. So this is simple normal saline coming into the uterus with a simple infant feeding tube and the cavity opens up and within a few seconds, you can see the entire cavity, no pathology, no fibroids, no polyps, no adhesions, and the cavity empties within a few seconds and your diagnostics are complete. You can, if you suspect polyps, you can fill up normal saline in the uterine cavity and delineate the polyp very clearly. And again, for secondary infertility in women who have used intrauterine devices, you can easily pick up the intrauterine devices. This is a device with the tail lost. This is a misplaced device. So it's very, very easy on transvaginal ultrasound to pick up misplaced intrauterine devices. Again, dermoid cysts with calcified parts in the cyst, endometriomas, uh, simple serous cysts, Endometrioma is again, this is typical picture of endometrioma. So ultrasound, vaginal ultrasound is really like a stethoscope is to a physician, polycystic ovaries, antral follicle counts, everything can be done with transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, we used to evaluate in the OPD, the tubal factor and the pelvic factor just by injecting normal saline. This is called the waterfall sign. Absolutely, so the inject a mixture of air and saline, and you can actually side. see the waterfall coming in ipsilaterally it next does to the and a waterfall you can confirm on transvaginal sonography. 
in a patient with the signs and if the reflux as seen clearly in the stem of the foley in this clipping is seen for certainty and the faster you inject the saline in the faster it goes back then it is definitely a case of bilaterally and if there are pelvic adhesions you can create a pelvic ascites if there is pelvic inflammatory to masses you can uh, uh, pick them up again with hydrosalpinges with something called the cyan procedure can artificially create a pelvic ascites and you see not only see the end of the fallopian tube but also the movement of the thick thin filmy this everything is, can be seen very well on transvaginal ultrasound this you can also use hysterosalping or contrast sonography for tubal patency you have nowadays echo waste yes. is a solution of micro particles of galactose now this contrast media is a positive contrast media as compared to saline which would we would describe as a negative contrast media here a small amount 2 to 5 ml of this positive contrast if injected as shown here we can see the uterine cavity the intramural portion of the tube the isthmic region of the tube and you can trace the ampullary region and also the fimbrial end coursing over the ovary and you see something akin to a waterfall sign around the ovary as seen just now so this echo is positive contrast sonography again for ibf you can use transvaginal ultrasonic and transvaginal catheter this makes ultrasound very easy one of the real good uses the one of the few uses of color doppler was the diagnosis of ovarian torsion so in this patient ovarian torsion was diagnosed post pick up post pick up using color doppler and uh, unfortunately it was discovered too late and this is a tost gangrenous adnexa just wanted to show you how it looks like so one must intervene go in early today you can do a laparoscopic untwisting of the adnexa if the gangrenous changes have not taken place you can also do interventional procedures following assisted reproduction in using transvaginal ultrasound like cyst aspiration that you see so simple cyst can be aspirated on first second day of periods before you begin stimulation for the ivf cycle it takes just a couple of minutes you can aspirate endometriomas before beginning the stimulation you can do egg retrieval using vaginal ultrasound guidance this is how egg retrieval is done so you put in a needle through the vagina into each ipsilateral ovary they are follicle stimulated follicles 18 19 mm in size and there is a single vaginal puncture a single ovarian puncture and from the single ovarian puncture you keep going into nearby follicles and aspirating everything short 5 minute procedure yes but all all complications uh, all medical procedures can also have complications and if you have in the training period you can have complication massive complications if you injure a vessel during any of these needling procedures we have a lot of experience on medical management of ectopic pregnancies using vaginal ultrasound and you know treating live ectopic pregnancies with uh, potassium chloride seeing that the heart shut down and then injecting methotrexate into the sac for quicker absorption or resorption so it takes 5 minutes is called transvaginal ultrasound guided salpingocentesis we do it only in tertiary hospitals where we have a good backup icu backup and i will show you some maybe a video from 2002 in my early training days on a portable machine and this is a live ectopic 8 weeks one day 
and we first put in a needle. We toothpick the fetus, the ectopic fetus, put in potassium chloride, stop the fetal hearts, confirm fetal hearts have stopped, withdraw the needle, and in the sac, we inject 50 milligram methotrexate as a local injection using vaginal ultrasound. So this is how we used to treat ectopic pregnancies. In super stimulation or controlled ovarian stimulation, again, you have vaginal ultrasound. Today you have 3D ultrasounds that have come in and I still don't see the benefit of 3D ultrasounds in monitoring. Uh, you have automated follicle sizing and volumes with these newer machines. And uh, basically, uh, the post-processing takes a lot of time, and I would still prefer a basic B-mode ultrasound, a grayscale ultrasound. Mullerian anomalies can be picked up very well with these 3D machines, and you can have different types of Mullerian anomalies picked up with these 3D machines, vaginal 3D machines. And this is my last slide that tells us where the research is going. So today you have heat sensors or thermal sensors being incorporated into the tips of the vaginal probes along with the sensors, sensing the image sensors, your thermal sensors. So the hypothesis is that a good heat map indicates a good oocyte within the follicle. And I will show you these two images. One is this image, see it very carefully. And one second. And one is this image, you see how big or how varied the heat map is. And see the second image. So this is the same patient, same ovary, one, one cycle stimulated with HMG and the other cycle stimulated with clomiphene citrate. Actually, they are propagating whether you know site quality can be picked up by vaginal ultrasound using heat maps but it's still experimental and not found its way in clinical medicine. 